is General Robert LeBlanc, who is going to be the featured speaker tonight. Where are you? Oh, there he is with the pink shirt on. Let's Roy Armenthal lives in New Iberia. He was along with the same operation. There he is back there with a hand in the air. And has Claude Galley got here yet? There he is sitting next to him. Okay, Claude, welcome. Jason Terrio is gonna put this whole thing on. He's done all the research for it. Jason, there he is over there. Okay. Jason, Jason Terrio. If you all were here for the Peleliu lecture, remember when the guy with the with the uh, helmet on and the 45 pistol that made me so nervous. Well, he put that one on too, if you'll remember. Jason Terrio. Yeah, unwind it from there and just. Well, hello. Thanks for uh, having me here again. I appreciate it. <clears throat> uh, before I get started, I would just like to say uh, that every time I'm invited for one of these types of events or uh, every time there's an event like this that goes on in our community, in my opinion, we are making history by preserving it. And we're fortunate to have many of the veterans who we, who we speak about and who we, who we study about uh, and, and who we research. And many of those gentlemen are here tonight. And so I want to thank Mr. C.J. Chris for once again putting on a great event program and uh, for inviting me. And, and, and uh, I wish you guys continued success here and also in the coming museum. So. Thank y'all. Let's get started right away. Uh, D-Day, June 6, uh, 1944. Pardon me, forgot one tool. Gotta have the clicker. D-Day, June 6, 1944, the Allied Invasion of Normandy, the most pivotal day in the history of the 20th century for many reasons. In my opinion, everything in the first half of the 20th century led up to this day, June 6, 1944. And everything that occurred in the second half is a direct result of the Allied invasion of the Normandy coast on June 6. Let's quickly take a look at some of the things that occurred leading up to it. Obviously, the trench warfare, World War I, the rise of totalitarian regimes, Nazis, fascists, Japanese imperialists, Pearl Harbor, North Africa, uh, the fall of France, advents of paratroopers, and of course the Higgins boats. All of these things led up to that pivotal moment in the history of the 20th century. And even after this date, obviously the liberation of France and the defeat of Hitler's Nazi Germany the uncovering of the evil doings of the Nazi party, the six million Jews who were killed in the Holocaust. Of course, the Bolsheviks and the rise of the Communist Party and the Communist movement in East Europe and also in Southeast Asia. Korea and even Vietnam could be pegged to this event. So why was D-Day such the great event? Why was it such a success? Can anybody answer that? Why was D-Day such a success? You spit them out. Europe. Sir? We put troops in Europe. Good start. Put troops in Europe. Anybody else? Yes, sir. We had some great intelligence. You're right. We did have some good. <laughs> We've got some guys here who were involved in some of that. D-Day was such a success because it was such a surprise. In 1944, everybody in the world knew that the Allies were going to attack and were going to invade France somewhere, some way in 1944. German high command knew it, even Hitler knew it. It was obvious, the troop built up in Europe, but yet we were the only ones who knew the exact time and the exact date. And this was Eisenhower's trump card. 170,000 Allied troops coming ashore on D-Day versus probably the world's most powerful uh, armed force in the history of modern warfare, the German Weimark. They had been occupying this country for four years. Uh, they had uh, taken over, essentially. 
They were ruling with a, a brutal dictatorship, and they held the high ground. Thirty some odd divisions within France, 1944. All right. So what was Hitler's plan for defending fortress Europe? Hitler believed that uh, the Allies were going to come ashore somewhere. And what he constructed was, of course, the Atlantic Wall, which was this massive fortification that, and if I'm not mistaken, we have a little laser here. The Atlantic Wall was built all along the coast of France. We're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of tons of concrete and barbed wire and underground mines. He was preparing for the eventuality when the Allies would one day come ashore. But he realized that the Atlantic Wall probably wouldn't stop the Allies from cracking the crust in France. The Atlantic Wall was designed to halt the Allies for 48 hours, 72 hours. That was what it was designed for. He believed that a decent-sized Allied force, eventually 170,000 troops, which is uh, 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 small compared uh, today's, uh, large compared to today's standards, but actually wasn't that very large of a force uh, compared to what Hitler had in France. And he was going to use his Mobile reserves. That was his plan for defending France. Within 24 to 48 hours, communications from whatever beach at the Pas de Calais, at Normandy, at Cherbourg, at Brest, or even down here on the southwestern part of France, communications would radio into German uh, high command, and they would send the 30-odd mobile reserves. Many of those were panzer units. We're talking some of the best equipment at the time in 1944. The German tank, the Tiger tank, was far superior than the Sherman tank, the, the US Army Sherman tank. The German artillery, the 88, was way more powerful than our 75s. Even the German soldiers and their officer corps were veterans of combat. Many of them had been in the Eastern Front. Many of them had, been fought, uh, had fought in North Africa and Italy. These were hardcore German soldiers. This was the most powerful force in the history of warfare. And against that, our 170,000 troops, many of them were 18, 19, 20-year-old kids who never fired a shot in combat, many of them. So when I say that Eisenhower's plan was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Hitler's plan was for defending Fortress Europe, Eisenhower's plan was for deception. He realized that if the brunt of these mobile panzer units could get to the beach in time, it wouldn't matter how many troops he threw up there. Within 24 to 48 hours, the German forces probably were able to push us back into the English Channel, probably forever. But his plan, Eisenhower's plan, was for deception. He formalized what was known, became known as Operation Fortitude. Operation Fortitude was a very dynamic, uh, a very brilliant deception plan, whereby uh, they had, uh, the Allies were using double-cross agents, false radio signals. I'm sure you've all heard some of the stories about this if you've been to the D-Day Museum. You've seen some of the photographs of the dummy tanks and the dummy landing craft. They actually had Hollywood directors come over and construct uh, and help uh, propagate this false uh, army division, the FUSAG, First United States Army Group. It didn't exist. And Operation Fortitude had to work because the Germans, the, the German Weimar had to be fooled into believing that the invasion would occur anywhere else but at the coast of Normandy. Part of the uh, uh, part of Operation Fortitude was to assign General Patton as its commander. The Germans believed that if and when, or I should say when, the Allies came ashore, who would lead this armada? Who would lead this in, uh, invasion? 
obviously the greatest general that we had in our arsenal, the most bolsterous, General Patton. So for the greatest invasion in the history of modern warfare, the man who believed he was the greatest commander of all time was essentially a guinea pig to fool the Germans into believing that we were coming anywhere but Normandy. Double cross agents, false radio traffic, sending communications to the German command that the Allies were preparing for an invasion at the Pas de Calais. The closest point from the cliffs of Dover to France is this 27 mile stretch right here at Calais. And that's where Hitler kept the majority of his panzer tanks in his mobile reserves waiting for the Allies to come. Of course, we all know they never came there, did they? <clears throat> we'll just back this up just for a second. Part of Hitler's plan in, in bringing these mobile reserves to the beach at a moment's notice, 48 hours, 72 hours, what have you, uh, would depend on one very important asset, transportation, obviously. How do you move a panzer division from 400 miles away to an area? What are some of the things that you'll need in order to move a tank division, sir? Rail. Gasoline. Gasoline, railroads, fuel, <coughs> tires, tank treads. What are all these little lines across here? These are all rivers. France was filled with rivers. You had to have bridges intact. You had to have routes. They didn't have interstates or, or freeways, but they had routes and road passages that had to lead to whatever area the Allies were coming ashore. Most importantly, you had to have communication. You had to have radio people, personnel, communications uh, to, to give uh, to, to give instructions at a moment's notice that the Allies were here. They're at the Pas de Calais, or they're at Normandy, or they're at Cherbourg, or they're in southern France. Communication was crucial to Hitler's plan for defending Fortress Europe. 48 to 72 hours. Remember that, folks. Operation Fortitude and Operation Overlord, the invasion of Normandy, could not have been pulled off, would not have been a success, without one very special group, the French Maquis, the Free French Resistance, a half a million men and women underground army in France who had been preparing for this day, June 6, 1944, ever since the fall of France, four years later, four years early, I should say. They had been scheming. They had been putting aside their political differences. There were dozens and dozens of these parties that came together for one common purpose. That was to aid the Allies in coming ashore and to prevent the German mobile reserves from reaching Normandy for 48 to 72 hours. <clears throat> and in the pre-dawn hours of June 6, 1944, this half a million man and woman army set off to begin their operation. They cut 900 railroads, 900 railroads that led to Normandy. They attacked enemy columns. They sabotaged locomotives by putting sand in the grease box. They put a sugar cube in the tanks, in the gasoline tanks of armored vehicles, shut them down. They had these foot-long giant tacks called tire busters. They threw thousands of these out on the road. They destroyed bridges and they destroyed communications. 48 to 72 hours later, no panzer reserves, no mobile reserves, not even a single tank. Think about this, folks. And when I say think about this, think about the contributions of the French resistance. What would one tank have done on Omaha Beach? One enemy tank. What would an entire Panzer Division of enemy tanks have done, could have done on Omaha Beach? The Marquis saw to it that that didn't happen. (coughs) 
General Eisenhower first found out about this resistance forces, these shadowy warriors who had been lurking in France for four years of occupation. He found out about them when he first met uh, Prime Minister Winston Churchill in 1942. The two had dinner. They had a greeting. Uh, though after several cocktails and drinks into the wee hours, something that Churchill was known for, and also our, our general here, into the wee hours of the morning, uh, Churchill began to uncover some of the secrets of the British intelligence. See, unlike the Americans, we were isolationists. We never dabbled in, in any of this espionage activities. We didn't read the other guy's mail, so to speak. But the British were doing it, and they were doing it fairly well. By 1940, early 1940, they had turned every single German agent that parachuted or came ashore into Britain on the Allied side. On the Allied side. They had cracked the Enigma code, the ultra cold breaking system, which had practically won the war. We were reading all the German plans. And of course, radar, something we didn't have at the time. And of course, the Free French Resistance Forces, which by 1942, uh, were beginning to build up and to gain some steam. So all of this was brand new information to General Eisenhower. He didn't know anything about it. And after this <clears throat> particular meeting, uh, General Eisenhower began to get the wheels turning, uh, so, that, so to speak. And within a year's time, the French Marquis began to get organized through special forces, through General Eisenhower's headquarters. And within a year after that, by 1944, we were practically disseminating information and serving as liaisons and contacting, coordinating events with this Marquis all day long. In order to uh, do all of the things that the Marquis did in those 24 first 48 hours of D-Day, they had to be supplied, they had to be informed, they had to have weapons. And these are some of the things that our special forces were helping with. This man was not the first to find out about the Maquis. This man was Colonel William Wild Bill Donovan. Donovan was a, a very eccentric character. He was a World War I hero, 69th Nash, uh, New York Regiment, same regiment our boys are, are with overseas right now. He was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Very powerful politician, very uh, well known internationally. And what Roosevelt wanted to do in 1940s, he sent this man, Wild Bill, on a fact-finding mission uh, throughout the international community to find out what was going on with this war. Particularly when he went to England, he met with Winston Churchill and some of the other leaders to figure out if Britain was going to be able to withstand uh, and, and to hold on for the German Blitz and an eventual possible invasion from the German Weimar across the English Channel. While he was there, he was led into the door of the British Secret Service, where he found out all the nasty little tricks that the British had been working on for all these years. This is real James Bond stuff. This is the British secret intelligence had been involved in all of this kinds of espionage, clandestine activity ever since the war first began. And on his trip back from Europe, Colonel Wild Bill began to come up with this idea to create America's own central intelligence network. And he created the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, predecessor to what we know today as CIA. From a small unit of, uh, let's say, 200 or so administrative staff by 1941, Four years later, 1945, OSS employed over 30,000 individuals. We're talking propaganda, special operations, intelligence gathering, you name it. Within four years, Donovan had taken OSS and the United States military to a different level. One of the most fascinating things about OSS, obviously, is the special forces that they were involved with and that they trained for. Uh, and some of the qualifications for OSS are listed here above. Number one, you had to volunteer for a special force operation for a mission. There was no information given to you uh, except that you must be willing to volunteer. Oh, and by the way, you must be willing to jump out of a parachute, uh, out of an airplane with a parachute. Can't tell you anything, any, anything more than that. 
All volunteers. OSS was all volunteers. You had to be physically fit, obviously. I mean, these guys were comparable to Rangers, Airborne, you name it. Had to be very mentally tough as well. You had to be excellent in communications. But the one most important aspect of OSS agents, you had to be able to speak the language that was native to the area where you would be operating in. And if by 1943, we all knew that France was going to be the pivotal battle, France is going to be where we were going to uh, liberate the country and take over the continent, obviously French-speaking agents were a must. What better place to find that, this particular individual's in South Louisiana? That's right. About a dozen or so uh, Cajuns, people from South Louisiana, served in OSS. We're fortunate enough to have a couple of them here uh, this evening. And before we continue, we'll just uh, quickly mention who they are. Y'all have already seen who they are. Uh, and just to let y'all know where they're from and where they served. Bob LeBlanc, retired Brigadier General from Abbeville, served in Special Forces uh, Headquarters Detachment with Third Army. Mr. Roy Armentar, there's the general. Let's get a round of applause for these guys as they, as they show. <laughs> Mr. Roy Armentar and Mr. Claude Galley from Montague. Op Codename PEG, operational group. They operated in southern France. These two gentlemen right here were in OSS. Sam Broussard was another gentleman, y'all may recall the names from, uh, he was from Brobridge, lived in New Iberia, was a state senator, he also owned a Sam Broussard Trucking Company. He was in Special Forces Detachment uh, with the 1st Army Headquarters. And Mr. Uh, Colonel Shirley Ray Trumps, also from Brobridge, participated in, in OSS. He was a member of Jedbergs, uh, which we'll get, it, we'll get to here in, in just a minute. So in 1943, all of Donovan's hard work began to caramelize. He began recruiting these men. And uh, just here are some statistics. 335 personnel all told uh, by 1943 were, were being recruited for these operations, uh, for operational groups. Now, the special operations were divided into two groups. You had operational groups, which is what Mr. Roy and Mr. Claude were involved with. These were 15-man commando hit-and-run teams that were experts in demolitions. Uh, and, and these men were aggressive. They parachuted into an environment, and they coordinated with the Maquis. And they attacked and they harassed enemy positions, and primarily uh, for enemy, uh, harassing enemy transportation via bridges and causeways and whatnot. Just some statistics on, on this, uh, this group. There were 15 men. They had five rifles, 15 pistols, 10 machine guns, two bazookas, 30 grenades per man, and each soldier carried an assortment of traps and mines and, and explosives and whatnot. These were very well-trained men, and all of them, all 15 in each group, spoke French. In 1944, at the bottom here, uh, 14 combat platoons of operational groups parachuted into France. The Jedbergs, this is the second group of special operations. The Jedbergs were typically a three-man inter-ally team, meaning that there was one American and, and typically one Frenchman and also uh, typically a British uh, radio operator. That's the basic makeup of a Jedburg team. Of course, that, that, uh, that wasn't always the case. They had uh, different setups for different, uh, different uh, occasions. But these guys basically went through the same types of training. You had to be physically fit. You had to be mentally fit. Uh, this, was a, this was a very special, unique individual who could be recruited for these type of operations. And in fact, it was such a secret organization we're only now finding out the true details about OSS and Jedbergs and 
operational group activities with the French Marquis. And in fact, during 1943, as these men were being recruited, FBI agents and OSS agents were investigating them and investigating their families. Uh, and in fact, Sam Broussard, the principal of uh, the uh, principal, the president of SLI, was the school that he was attending at the time, was interviewed uh, by OSS to make sure that he was who he said he was. So this is a very special group. Jedbergs were also uh, especially trained in communications, in different types of radio and Morse code. They also had to go through a stress test where they sat an individual down and they tried to break him down and sweat him out, like a Gestapo style interrogation. These men were gonna have to be so perfect, so well trained, that in order to do operations behind enemy lines, to speak the language and to coordinate with the Maquis, the resistance, and to be able to conduct their mission, get the intelligence, blow the bridge, call in airdrops for supplies, and get out of there without getting caught. Here's some of the training as we continue on. These men were all experts in demolitions, as I said before. And they were all trained uh, in Washington, D.C. By the end of 1943, the JED teams, uh, excuse me, the JED agents and the operational groups uh, had been created and they were sent overseas for operations in France. The JEDs went to England and the operational groups went to the Mediterranean where they operated out of uh, North Africa in Oran. Both of these different uh, operational, uh, both of these different groups had similar type training once they arrived overseas as well. For the operational groups, the 15-man commando teams, Mr. Roy and Mr. Claude, uh, they were members of Team PEG, P-E-G, that was their call sign, their code name. And they were training in the Atlas Mountains with also French commandos and British commandos. And they were training to live off of the land, because that's what they were going to have to do once they parachuted into France. And Mr. Roy, uh, made a funny comment. He said, you know, we didn't have a whole lot of rations. Food was scarce. But a cootie knows what to steal and what to kill <laughs> in order to stay alive. So they would raid these Arabs' gardens, and they'd steal their vegetables and, and shoot some of their sheep, I'm sure, and hunt javelinas at night. So they were able to get by. I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, the rest of the men in the unit were uh, were a little excited to have a Cajun meal up in the mountains of, uh, in Oran. But anyway, so uh, once a Cajun, always a Cajun, huh, Mr. Roy? So as they're operating in their training, they go through parachute training uh, in Oran. And they went through several jumps before they were actually certified um, as paratroopers. And then they were also preparing for their missions, which were going to take place uh, beginning in August of 1944 in southern France. Now the Jeds, once they got to England, they went through a little bit different training, obviously. Uh, Three-man teams. Uh, in April of 1944, the Jeds teams were finally constructed. And Mr. Ray Trumps, uh, he, he mentioned to me over a uh, telephone interview, he said the way that the Jeds uh, married, the way that the teams were constructed, was they had a cocktail party. And all the Jeds were invited. And you walked around and you mingled and you tried to find your lover, as he said. So you would find a guy who you could rely on and who you could trust and who you knew through training and who you knew was going to be a good partner. And so that's where Colonel Ray Trumps uh, chose, chose his French Jedberg agent as well. And so Team Ronald was born, as well were dozens of other Jedberg teams were born from this one particular event. And in the meantime, uh, I believe a British uh, radio operator was assigned to Team Ronald. And we'll get to Team Ronald and some of their contributions a little later on. <clears throat> some of the other things, some of the other training that uh, I think you'll find fascinating uh, with the Jedbergs, uh, they, they actually brought in some French officers to train these French-speaking soldiers 
Many of them were Cajuns. Some of them were actually from, um, from uh, the New England states as well. They were training these men, the, the French officers were training them on how to perfect their patois and teaching them the customs and the mannerisms of the areas that they were going to be operating in. For example, a Frenchman does not eat his gumbo the way that we do. He does not eat soup the way that we eat soup. A Frenchman will take the front of his bowl and lift it forward and will take his spoon and scoop it outwards, which is something totally different from what we do. But if you're, a French, if you're, a, if you're an agent in France, you need to act like the French. When in Rome, do what the Romans do. Also, if you smoke cigarettes, the Frenchman, when he smokes a cigarette, he smokes it down to the bare nub. And when there's nothing left, okay, he takes a toothpick and he smokes it down to just the ash. There's nothing left. So if you smoke cigarettes, okay, and you are an OSS agent, your, your fingers had better be brown and your teeth better be brown as well. Not, not too sure what the, uh, the, the Army training manual is for hygiene concerning that, but uh, um, definitely uh, there were some interesting mannerisms that these guys had to learn. Another interesting part of training, uh, General LeBlanc uh, stated this, that if you're operating, and these men were trained to do this, if you're operating behind the lines, behind enemy territory, very dangerous, and you come across, let's say, a bar or a restaurant, meeting place, in France. And if you walk in and everything is completely normal, kind of like how the setting is this evening, everyone's just kind of sitting around, then something was wrong. If everything was normal, then there was danger in the area for that OSS agent. That meant that there was a Nazi sympathizer in the corner or maybe some OSS soldiers who were camping out in the back. But if you walked in and you had a, a Frenchman who was sitting at the bar, let's say with his collar flipped up, which is something kind of out of the ordinary, that was a key sign that everybody here was friendly and that they could conduct uh, their intelligence gathering accordingly. So you had to be very careful. This is, these men were at times walking on very thin ice, uh, especially in France with the Germans hot on their tail. So these are some of the training that these men had to go through. And as I said earlier, uh, in April of 44, the Jedburgh teams were created. The operational groups in North Africa were finalizing their training as well. Here's just some photographs. Uh, the top left is uh, uh, some Jedburgh's uh, training for radio operations. On the right-hand side, some instructional classes. Bottom left, uh, small arms training. These men were expert, expert riflemen and, and small arms uh, marksmen. Just some other photographs, uh, the tower, uh, climbing the wall. Here are the radios that, that these, uh, these operators used, uh, a similar type uh, radios that were dropped in with these agents into France. And typically, uh, what a JED agent would do or a, a special forces detachment liaison officer would do or uh, the radio operator for an operational group would do is they would string up their radio, send out a coded signal back to London, pull it down, move to a new location, and within 30 minutes, London was sending them a signal on, a response signal on how to proceed with their actions. Uh, and the reason being, obviously, the, the Germans were always uh, looking for radio traffic and always looking for an opportunity to uh, to discover Jedbergs operating in France. Just some of the equipment that they used. And I think we've covered the, the, the top one, but the bottom one, towards the end of their training in London, uh, in England, I should say, the Jedbergs went through a three-day exercise where an agent was stripped of all of his documentation, all of his identification, and was dropped in the middle of a city and was told to get on such and such bus, ride to such and such street, and to break into such and such building, climb into an office, and steal a document or an artifact or a piece of material from this 
from this office that was locked and then get out of there without the British Secret Service uh, catching you. And the Secret Service were hot on your tail the whole time. They didn't realize that you were just uh, an American Jedburg practicing. Uh, and so the idea was to shake the tail, as General LeBlanc says, evade being captured and complete your mission. Something typical that uh, these men may face with operations in France. Just some, uh, some more information about, uh, about operations. The bottom one here, on, in April of 44, a little pointer. Uh, this is important here. Liaison and staff officers were chosen for special forces headquarters detachments. Eisenhower and the bunch, uh, a month before D-Day, realized, okay, so we've got Jedbergs operating in small groups, three-man teams with the Maquis, who are half a million men by this time, and we've got um, 900,000 soldiers to two million who are waiting to come ashore within the first month of D-Day. How is an American soldier and a French resistance fighter going to communicate? Hand signals? So that's when this was decided to take a group of these men who had some staff experience uh, who were uh, officers and non-commissioned officers and to attach them to various uh, uh, army units operating within France. General LeBlanc, for example, was assigned to Special Forces Detachment Number 11 and he was assigned to Patton's Third Army, which was not operational until the 1st of August. And since he had uh, a, a good bit of experience in censorship, which is where, uh, where he did some of his uh, his earlier military service before joining the OSS. General LeBlanc was sent to, uh, to the southeastern part of, Fran of, of England to help facilitate with Operation Fortitude and with some of the false radio traffic that was going on. So he was part of that for, uh, for, uh, for five weeks at least uh, from, uh, from D-Day until the time he, he came ashore in July. Uh, Sam Broussard was attached to Special Forces Number 10 uh, with the First Army. And actually, Sam, an interesting story, he actually sat in on one of Eisenhower's briefings to discuss uh, some of the Maquis situations. And he went ashore on D plus one with the First Infantry Division uh, as their liaison officer. And so Sam came ashore, and some of the things that he was involved with uh, almost immediately was to find some of these French Maquis and to interrogate them, as he says, to find out that they were legitimate and that they were willing to work for the Allies and to assign these various individuals to uh, 7th Corps, which was uh, 9th, 4th, and the 79th Infantry Divisions for their attack on the Conantan Peninsula and, of course, the Siege of Sherbert. And right off the back, he found 13 willing Maquis workers uh, who he knew by name, got to know fairly well, and attached four or five of them to each division. And these were men who knew exact locations of enemy positions, exact coordinates. They knew where each individual enemy tank was hiding in a barn, or where particular minefields were located, or what German battalion was in this little town. They knew it all. They were from this area. They had been preparing for this for four years. And here comes along Sam Broussard, a French-speaking GI, and all of this was already pre-planned uh, for the most part. And there he was assigning these French Maquis to these infantry divisions to go ahead uh, of, of the advance up through the Conantan Peninsula and eventually on to Sherbert. <clears throat> Here's the breakup of, uh, of, of Special Forces Detachment uh, and, and sort of how it was, it was divided. If you look right in the middle, right here, basically uh, a, a detachment was one officer, General LeBlanc, uh, a driver and two radio operators with a jeep. And they would steam ahead of, of these, the spearhead divisions of that particular army uh, to coordinate and to contact the Maquis. 55 original volunteers. 35 were eventually selected. Pardon me.
This is a map of some of the Maquis strongholds uh, throughout France. And you can see that the dashed line in the middle separates the northern sector from the southern sector. Uh, and, and in terms of what we're talking about tonight, the northern sector, you could think of it as the Jedburg territory, the southern sector, the operational group territory that was coming from Oran. But as you can see, uh, these are Maquis units uh, French uh, forces of French interior, FFI, uh, that were well organized all throughout here. One thing that Sam Broussard was also in charge of <clears throat> in London is what he refers to as the card deck system, which was a map that showed all the locations of the various agents, both French and American, that were operating within France. And he was in contact uh, with, with many of these units. So all of these guys knew what was going on. They knew where some of these French Maquis leaders were hiding out. They knew their contact name, their call signs, and that's how they would approach uh, individuals. When General LeBlanc would, would try to contact an agent, he would have his driver drive the Jeep up ahead and he'd get out and he'd cross the line behind enemy lines. He'd rendezvous with a Maquis fighter who would then take him on to meet with whatever particular Maquis agent uh, that he was instructed to meet with, and then from there conduct their intelligence and uh, gathering and whatnot. This is a map of uh, May of '44. <clears throat> There's a photograph of Sam Broussard. Uh, Sam passed away about 10 years ago. Uh, this is a photograph of him taken in the late '80s, and the sword up here has some very sentimental value to. Uh, to Sam and the Broussard family. After uh, the Sherberg was captured uh, and, and Sam was, was up there uh, <clears throat> assigning various Maquis uh, to the infantry divisions, and, and he even knew these guys by name. And, and some of them are, are names that we know of today, like Gerard and LaRue and, uh, and Olivier. These are all uh, men that he had become friendly with. One of them was killed in the line of duty, uh, and Sam was asked to pay I believe it was 100,000 francs. Uh, does that sound right? Something like that, 100,000 franc, French francs paid to the widow of this man. And he was coming back from Cherbourg when he ran across a German general who had the sword and saber, and he captured him. And a, a French marquis uh, who was friends with uh, Major Broussard at the time said, look, let me hold on to it and get it after the war. Sam thought he'd never see it again. 35 years later, he and his wife were touring France and they came to a little town, uh, which was an area where this particular Marquis man uh, had lived, and he came and presented Sam with the sword and saber that he had captured uh, in June of 44. So there, there it hangs even today at the Broussard home. <clears throat> and so by July, uh, by the middle of July, once we had kind of begun to push out of the Normandy hedgerows, by this time the Germans had finally called up their mobile reserves a month later, a little bit too late. Uh, but on July 17th, uh, Bob LeBlanc and his team showed up in France. And they were assigned to Patton's headquarters with Third Army. It's going to be a couple of weeks before Patton got rolling with his armored divisions. Uh, but as soon as uh, Bob LeBlanc landed, he was already beginning uh, to gather some very important intelligence. He came ashore in Utah Beach, found him a French farmer, and began to interrogate him for some very uh, important information. He asked him, where's the Calvados? Calvados is an apple liqueur, a brandy only made in Normandy. They're famous for it. It's a very high potent uh, liquor. And so as soon as he arrives there, he sees a Frenchman who's just ecstatic to see the American GIs have showed up. And he walks in and he starts talking to him, conducting his, his, uh, his intelligence like he was trained to do. So he, he discovers that this Frenchman has got some Calvados uh, stashed away out in the cellar. So then he starts 
a little, a little negotiating with them. Uh, at first, the Frenchman said, no, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Never heard of Calvados. We don't have any of that around here. And so uh, General LeBlanc sends his, his driver out to the Jeep to come back with two cartons of cigarettes. Pulls out a cigarette and starts smoking with him lucky stripes in front of that Frenchman who probably hadn't had a decent cigarette in, in years. And uh, obviously probably never had a Lucky Strike cigarette. And so the freshman starts thinking, well, OK, all right, I got some Calvados. What you got to, what you got to carry in it? And so General LeBlanc goes back and sends his driver to get back a five-gallon bucket. <laughs> and they fill this bucket up with uh, Calvados. And it's, 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 have any of y'all had it? Y'all know what I'm talking about, Calvados? It is really potent. You drink it about that much in a little snifter glass. And uh, if you, you got to keep it kind of far away from you, from your facial hair, or it'll burn it off. Uh, and uh, the, a combat historian, Forrest Poe, who's uh, the original oral historian of World War II, stated that uh, Calvados uh, is, is along the same lines as uh, snake venom. I mean, it's that powerful. Uh, I'm sorry, anti-venom, I should say. Um, so if you get bit by a snake, you can just take a little swig of Calvados and pour it on there, and you'll be all right. <laughs> So he goes back to headquarters and he says, all right, I've, I've, I've done some, some good work, sir. At a five gallon bucket of this powerful Calvados. So the guys are, oh, you know, they're all ecstatic and they're excited. And uh, he says, well, you didn't get us any brie cheese? Another thing Normandy is, is kind of known for uh, is, is this, this brie cheese. You know, they were all dairy farmers. They all had cattle and, uh, uh, and, and, and lots of egg farms in Normandy. And they said, well, go back out there and find us some brie cheese. And uh, Le LeBlanc says, uh, well, if you're going to do that, you're going to have to give me some money because I've got to get the cheese from the French monks and they don't smoke Lucky Strikes. <laughs> so they said, all right, allocate them some funds. You know, we, need, we need some of this cheese. We got our, we got our whiskey, now we need the cheese. So uh, he goes over and he finds some French, some, some monks, and he's talking to them and he's trying to work out the deal. And uh, he pays them for it. And then he pulls out a couple of packs of cigarettes just as a nice gesture. And the monk said, oh, oh, cigarettes. Give, give us some more of that. Give, here, take the money back. Give us all of them cigarettes. So they loaded them up with Lucky Strikes. And the, and the French monk said, look, anytime you want some cheese, uh, you, you know where to find us. Just keep bringing those Lucky Strikes cigarettes back. But, uh, but all kidding aside, as, as soon as LeBlanc uh, began moving uh, through the interior of Normandy, uh, of course, he ran across uh, some of the horrible scenes of war, the, the terrible fighting in the Normandy hedgerows. Uh, the, uh, the Operation Cobra, which was the breakthrough at St. Lo, uh, where 3,000 approximately Allied bombers just uh, blew a hole through the earth right near St. Lo. And uh, General passed through that, and he, he stated that uh, it's a, it was as if a bulldozer had just come through and just plowed away this entire earth. Um, about 600 Allied casualties as a result of that uh, friendly fire incident. He came in contact with his first French agent. He was a priest. Le Cure, is that correct? Le Cure. Le Cure, the priest. The priest. And so he, he goes into confession, and, uh, and, and, and they give the code word or whatever it was. And then the priest realized who he was, and he realized that the priest was Le Cure. And so they start talking, and the, the priest is just down and out on himself. And, uh, uh, Bob LeBlanc says, what's the, what's the matter? What's wrong? And he says, uh, the priest says, well, a, a German officer had come around asking questions uh, and looking for a drink of water. So he came up to the well, and uh, I, I knew you guys were on your way. So he came up to the well, and he told me to hold his helmet and to pump the water while he took a sip out of the well. And when the German bent over to grab a sip of water, I whacked him over the head with his helmet and killed him. He's buried over there in my garden. General LeBlanc said, Father, Father, in his French dialect, don't worry, the Pope will forgive you. <laughs> Towards the end of July, after the Battle of St. Lo, the breakout of Normandy, Third Army headquarters arrives. Patton's tanks were raring to go. The Germans are on the retreat. Cherbourg has been captured. Now we're going to be moving south. 
We're going to be moving into the interior of France to chase the Germans all the way back to Berlin. Uh, and this is just a map of, you'll see the, the, the breakthrough here occurred here, and the, 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 the hinge kind of pivoted out this way to allow uh, the, the uh, Allied forces to come through the gap down here. And Avranche was a, a, a key area. It held some bridges over some very key uh, rivers that allowed the Allies to get into the Brittany <coughs> Peninsula area. And as being attached to Third Army, General LeBlanc and his little team, they were codenamed Underfoot, uh, they were assigned to the lead armored division, the 4th Armored Division, also known as Patton's Best. Uh, this was the spearhead unit that was, uh, that was ordered to cut clean across uh, Brittany. I believe I have a map of that. To cut clean across Brittany, here's Avranche, here's Normandy. To cut clean across the Brittany Peninsula and sever it, shutting off the uh, German supplies and communications lines. And his job was to ride ahead of the armored division and to coordinate with the Maquis all down this line to secure the bridges and to secure the, uh, the passageways and to pass up Rennes, where French Maquis were, uh, were, were to eliminate pockets of resistance, of, uh, of German resistance, all the way down to, uh, to the southern shores of Brittany Peninsula at Nantes. Whereas the 6th Armored Division was to cut clean across the peninsula with the Maquis guiding them all along the way, attacking and harassing enemy, holding and securing bridges all the way to Brest. This was going to be the main allied port uh, for, the, uh, for the retaking of the continent, Brest. Or one of these two, either Brest or Lorient, uh, were going to be the two areas where allies were going to bring the mother load, the sons of democracy. Uh, that didn't happen, but we'll, we'll get to that here in a minute. This is just a map of where some of the, uh, some of the Jedburgh agents uh, had parachuted into Brittany. Brittany became sort of the cornerstone of special forces operations, primarily with Jedburghs. Uh, dozens of, of, of these guys parachuted into Brittany. There were 50,000 Germans held up in this garrison here. And as I said before, the plan was to, uh, to eliminate all of them and to capture these major port cities to be able to allow them to facilitate the, the uh, offloading of the millions of tons of supplies. So Jeds were trained for these special types of operations. Maquis were prevalent throughout this area, thousands of them. And so Maquis, guided by OSS Jedbergs, really did a number on the Germans within this area. <clears throat> Jedberg team Ronald, who was uh, Ray Trump's, parachuted into this area with his team down here in the south uh, in, in the area known as Kimper. Uh, and his mission uh, was to coordinate with the Maquis uh, and to conduct some of, their some of their operations to harass Germans uh, and to, uh, to, to cut off roadblocks as the Germans were trying to get to Brest. This is a fortress city here. It took uh, till September before, before Patton's forces were able to capture it. General Ball will get into uh, some, of, uh, some more of the Jedburgh operations here a little later on, a little later on particularly uh, Colonel Ray Trumps, whose uh, brother-in-law is, is here with us traveled all the way from Opelousas. Uh, Mr. Herbert, wave your hand. As a relative of uh, Colonel Trump's. Thank you for coming. <clears throat> so Brittany, as I said, became the cornerstone. This is a place where uh, the stuff of legends were made. And some of these stories are just truly unbelievable. Uh, some of the, the actions that the Jedbergs got involved with some of the heated battles. Ray Trumps was, was wounded. Uh, a couple of these guys were, were captured and who were, uh, were executed on the spot. <clears throat> but Brittany was also uh, where the Maquis or the FFI headquarters was going to be located for this particular 
region. And all of this had been planned out before. Uh, a general by the name of Eon was going to be commanding this particular uh, region, if you will, of Brittany. And his call sign was Alos. Uh, and mission Alos was to bring in this general um, and, and, his, and his team to begin to set up a command post. And by July and, and early August, Sam Broussard was involved in, in, uh, in activities such as this to come in from his operations up with First Army and to come in to assist in Operation Alos. He came right here to the center of Brittany, uh, Sam Broussard did, and he met up with some of these guys from Alos in a place called Carrion. And this is just a photograph, it's not, not a very well uh, photograph, but nonetheless, this is a, a photograph of Maquis, French Resistance, FFI, who are, um, who are standing at attention during an inspection by some of these ALOs staff members. And uh, Sam Broussard was involved in organizing this group because there was a, a German, a, a large sized German force that was going to be coming to the area to take the town. Kemper, uh, excuse me, Carrie Ann was located right in the heart of Brittany where the main railroad passed and where the main transportation routes passed. So that needed to be secured and needed to be held at all costs. And the, uh, the, the story of Carrie Ann, Sam Broussard took a handful of these guys and went up to this hill where the Germans were preparing to make an attack that evening. And he sent word through a, a German-speaking Frenchman to tell the Germans up on the hill that if they don't surrender, the American agents are going to call in bombers to come and bomb the hill to oblivion. Obviously, the Germans didn't fall for that. They came back down and spoke with, the, uh, uh, spoke with Sam, and they said, they're not going to do it. And he said, well, tell them to go back up there again, and, and if they don't surrender by 4 o'clock, tell them that they will definitely be blown off of that hill. Again, it didn't work. The Germans stayed up there. Would you believe that by 4 o'clock, two little Piper Cubs are seen <laughs> off in the distance? A spotting for a reconnaissance or artillery, and the Germans believed that these were the reconnaissance aircrafts that were going to proceed the Allied bombing of that particular hill. They threw up their hands, waved the white flag, and came down. 150 of them surrendered to a band of about 35 Maquis and Sam and his unit. <clears throat> that, was a, that was a carry in. And uh, here's, a, here's a quote from General Bradley from his book, Soldier Story. He said, we had 50,000 Germans operating in Brittany. We were forced to sidetrack a division to capture the peninsula. An even greater force would have been required had not the FFA rallied 17 battalions of Maquis to assist in pinning down the Germans. So once again, the Maquis uh, showcased their talents. The OSS operations were there to uh, coordinate and to organize these bands of Maquis. They were actually even assigned to pay them. Many of these guys jumped into France carrying uh, money belts full of francs to pay for some of these resistance fighters. And by August, uh, middle of August of 1944, Patton's forces had cut the peninsula in half and were veering to the east to chase the Germans all the way back to the Siegfried Line. And I'm sure you've all heard uh, about the longest sustained drive in history, which was Third Army's drive from Nantes to Orléans, Troyes, Nancy, and all the way into Metz. But some of the history books neglect to say who was ahead of his forces, protecting those vital bridges, protecting those vital roadways, uh, harassing the enemies that were in the area, attacking them, eliminating these pockets of resistance. That was the French Maquis, and they were being coordinated by special forces detachments, primarily underfoot, General LeBlanc and his group. Right about the same time, August 12th, to be exact, 1944, Operation, uh, excuse me, uh, Operational Group PEG, parachutes into southern France. 
right here. And that's what Mr. Roy, Mr. Claude's unit was, uh, was a part of. The, the purpose of their mission, Operation PEG, the 15-man commando unit, was to cut the, uh, the vital bridges and the, uh, the, the routes in the Carcassonne area. See, within a, number, a matter of days, the Allies were going to launch Operation Anvil Dragoon, which was the invasion of southern France, to go along with uh, Operation Overlord from the north, and of course the Russians coming in from the east. So they were going to bottle up the Germans right here in the center. And so to preclude that invasion, these operational groups were parachuted into southern France to once again uh, organize the Maquis resistance, hold the vital bridges, destroy bridges if that's what it called for, and attack enemy, uh, enemy forces throughout. And they were successful. Captured a number of Germans, uh, spent, I believe it was about 10 days in the field, in the countryside with the uh, Marquis. And uh, both of the gentlemen here tonight were wounded as a result of their uh, combat experience here in southern France. Um, General Blau will get a little bit more into detail about uh, PEG, Operational Group PEG. <laughs> Intermission. Okay. Almost. <laughs> Almost. Okay. Some interesting statistics. 50% of Allied intelligence for all of France was provided by OSS and French resistance. That's a staggering number, isn't it? These were a, a special group of men. They were trained in the dark arts of espionage. They worked un undercover and behind enemy lines and they helped defeat the Germans in France. These are the Cajuns of OSS. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>